I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you, happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages, I puck the Comic Weekly straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine, thank you. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, too. And we have a little surprise for you today in the comics. Oh, goody. I love surprises, especially when they come in the comics. Tell me about it, please. Beginning today, we have a new comic. That's wonderful. What's it called? It's called Beetle Bailey, the story of a fellow who's in the army. What's he like? Well, he's something like Dagwood. He's always getting into trouble. <laughs> that should be funny. <laughs> it is. And we'll read it in just a moment, because that's on the very first page. Oh, goody. Then please hurry and read the funny. Buck the comic yes. weekly. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, our new hero, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. At the army post where Beetle is stationed, it's mail time. And as the sergeant passes out letters to the men, he says... Box for Bailey! And tosses a big box to Beetle Bailey. One of the men says, Hi, it's that cake he's been expecting. Beetle starts to walk off with his package. Hi, he's trying to sneak off without showing it. I stop him! Away Beetle goes like a shot out of a gun. <laughs> my girl made this for my birthday, and it's all mine. Through the top sergeant's office he goes. <laughs> Out the window, last picture, top row. <laughs> First picture, bottom row. The men see a trash can bumping along by itself. One of them yells, Stop that trash can! Beetle leaps out of the trash can. <laughs> Meanwhile, as the chase for the cake goes on, an officer waits beside a car. He looks at his watch and says, Now where's that messenger with that new mine they developed at the proving grounds? It has to be on that plane for Washington in ten minutes. Just then, Beetle dashes by, the package in his hands. Second picture, bottom row, the officer yells, I said, give me that. I'll just make the plane. As Beetle stops in dismay, the car drives off with Beetle's cake. Last picture at Army headquarters, seven generals and admirals are staring at the cake, which has a candle sticking up out of it. One of them says, Well, so that's the new secret weapon. Huh? And an admiral says, uh, you know, it looks sort of like a cake. Another general says very importantly, Well, it's hard as a rock. And a general at the head of the table says, Well, let's get busy and see how quick we can turn out a million of them. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> they think the cake is a secret weapon. <laughs> I guess it's because of that candle sticking up out of it. It looks like a secret weapon. <laughs> and the general says, get busy and make a million of them. Well, that'd be a good way to win a war. Throw cake in the face of the enemy. How could you win the war that way? Well, when the enemy sits down to eat the cake, you sneak up and take their guns away from them. And then you say, surrender, or we won't give you any more cake. Oh, and since everyone likes cake, well, then they surrender. Yeah. That's a wonderful idea. Sure. And here's another wonderful idea. Let's turn over the page to Prince Valiant. Oh, yes. I'm anxious to read that because Val has been telling young Arf the story of Thule. That's the country King Egg was the ruler of. And he was telling Arf how he had gone in search of adventure and found savage Huns trying to capture the castle of Andalcrag, where men who loved goodness and kindness and justice and beauty lived. And those were about the only people left in that part of the world who were good people. That's right, and that's why Val wanted to help them. He slipped into the castle and joined Prince Cameron, leader of the troubadours who loved beauty and music and fought against the Huns. But then another terrible attack came against the castle. I wonder what'll happen. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hackett, Breckett, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Tells the story of the next attack of the Huns. 
the savage Huns built siege machines, tall towers by which they tried to climb over the top of the castle wall. But with grapples, we rocked their towers back and forth till they tumbled. <laughs> then they tried battering rams. For days, they hammered away at the walls. And when finally the walls tumbled, they found we had built another inner wall, as strong as the first, and still they could not pass. Always, Prince Cameron was ever in the forefront of the battle, an example to all in the splendor of his manhood. The defenders were fewer now, but nothing could dampen the spirits of these gallant people. <laughs> Although they had fought fiercely upon the walls, and many were wounded, when their moments of rest came, they sang and played gaily with good will in their hearts for each other. And then came the day we feared. There was no more food and drink. We are at a banquet table, which you see in the big picture. And then Prince Cameron rose to his feet, smiling into the eyes of his comrades for the last time. He said, last picture, The Huns rule from sea to sea. We are the last of the warrior troubadours. Because of our ideals, the world has been a better place to live in. Only Andalcrag stands unconquered. It will cease to exist, still unconquered. Tomorrow we will do that which we have to do. What does he mean, what they're going to do tomorrow? I think he expects tomorrow they'll have another battle, the most desperate of all. But how can they have strength to fight if they have nothing to eat? I wonder, too. Well, next week we'll find out. Now, let's go over the page, past the Lone Ranger. Oh, look, there's Robin Hood on page five. Yes, brave Robin Hood, who has defied the cruel sheriff of Nottingham, who hates Robin Hood because he helps the poor people. And you last week, you remember, Robin Hood had met a nice man named Friar Tuck, and just as they crossed the river, the sheriff's men came galloping out of the woods and surrounded Robin Hood. I, I wonder if he'll be caught. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with the story of Robin Hood. It's merry, merry England in days long ago. Time now for Robin Hood. Some music. Hi-ho! As the sheriff's men attack, Friar Tuck springs to the defense of the trapped Robin Hood. But the sheriff fells him with the swift blow of the sword. <clears throat> then pointing to Robin Hood, he shouts, Take him alive! Robin stands surrounded by the sheriff's men. He drops his sword to the ground and raises his hands above his head. As the men relax for a second, thinking he's caught, suddenly Robin springs in the air, catches the limb of a tree, swings his feet forward, and kicks one of the guards against several of the others. Drop him! There he goes! He leaps over some bushes. The last picture top row dashes across the shallow stream. First picture bottom row, the sheriff shouts to his archers, Bring him down! Crouching low, Robin scrambles out of the stream onto the opposite bank as arrows whiz around his ears. The sheriff's men dash across the stream in pursuit. Suddenly, a volley of arrows burst from the slope above Robin Hood. The sheriff's men fall him. Last picture. Robin breaks through the brush to see his men crouching behind trees, sending arrow after arrow at the sheriff's men. And one of them shouts, You brought us good hunting, Master Robin! Ooh, hooray, hooray! Robin escaped! Not only escaped, but led the sheriff's men straight into an ambush where Robin's merry outlaws can give them what they deserve. Yes, and they deserve whatever they get for being so mean. You're so right. Well, now let's go to the very last page of the first section and see what Flash Gordon's up to. All right. And he, here he is on the last page of the first section, and I'm anxious to read about Flash because he's in a terrible situation. You bet he is. He, he'd been a prisoner of Pyron on that strange ship that could control the comets, but he'd captured Pyron, who was the leader, and defeated those ugly little comet men. But while Flash was changing the course of the comet ship so it wouldn't crash with the Earth, the comet men had opened a hatch and let in fire gas that began to heat the airship. And it got so hot that Flash knew they would all die if he didn't do something. So now he's fighting the comet men who aren't bothered by this heat. What'll happen? He's got to find some way to close the doors so the heat won't come in and kill them dead. Well, let's see how he manages. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega rega doon doon saskimatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> In his insulated asbestos suit, 
Flash wades through the flaming gases of the comet's head. With swift and deadly ray bursts, he blasts the comet men away from the space sphere's airlock before they are able to complete their work of sabotage. And then suddenly, Flash's ray gun stops shooting, and he sees to his horror that it is melting in the intense heat. From a trusted weapon, it has changed instantly into a supercharged bomb ready to backfire any second. Last picture top row, Flash hurls the ruined ray pistol as far as possible from the airlock, then dodges back inside the cabin. Even so, he is badly shaken as the gun's explosion scatters the comet men like ten pins. The survivors attempt to close in on their unarmed foe, first picture bottom row. Flash seizes the nearest comet man by the ankle and whirls him around like a baseball bat, driving the scaly armored attackers off into space. <laughs> With his enemies temporarily scattered, Flash attempts to seal the space sphere's gaping hole in a desperate effort to keep out the comet's fiery atmosphere. With Zarkov's aid, he successfully patches the outer shell with flashed iron patch plates from the ship's emergency locker. In the meantime, the comet is carrying the spaceship headlong toward the sun's all-consuming cosmic furnace. Flash and Zarkov finish their repairs then race back to the instrument room just in time to catch the treacherous Flamma in a daring attempt to overcome Dale and seize control of the comet world. Ooh, that was exciting, wasn't it? I bet it? it was. Flash has seen an awful lot of action, but I don't think I've ever seen so much happen so fast as it did right there. No, neither did I. You think he's in time to stop Flamma from getting Dale's weapon? Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, and here they are on the first page of the second section. And here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Ram a food, am a fum, zim zam zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> the phone rings in the Bumstead house. Dagwood answers it. Hello? Uh, I'd like to speak to your wife. It's uh, quite important. Dagwood puts the phone down, dashes out of the house. <laughs> Blondie! Last picture top row, he dashes down the street. Ain't you see Blondie, Mrs. Snuggles? Well, yes, I saw her walking that way a while ago. First picture, second row, Blondie finds the phone off the hook, and she exclaims, My goodness, what's the receiver doing off the hook? Hello? When she hears what the man wants, she oh, says, no. Oh, well, I'm sorry, but you'll have to talk to my husband about that. Last picture, second row, Blondie dashes out of the house. Dagwood! Dagwood! Meanwhile, first picture, third row. Dagwood is still dashing down the street, asking everybody, Have you seen Blondie? And Blondie is dashing down the street, asking everybody, Have you seen Dagwood? Last picture, third row, Dagwood dashes around the corner and sees Blondie dashing down an alley. And he shouts, Blondie, you want it on the phone! Come home, quick, it's you they want! First picture, bottom row, he dashes into the house, stops at the phone, picks up the phone. Hello? And the man on the phone answers, Hello, Mr. Bockheimer? Mr. Bockheimer? Oh! And he turns to Blondie and says, The man had the wrong number. And Blondie, who's lying on the sofa, exclaims, Oh, I'm so exhausted, I can't make supper. You have to take us to a restaurant. Last picture, they're all at a restaurant. And as the waiter brings in their dinner, Blondie smiles cheerfully. Mm, it turned out happy for everybody after all, didn't it? And Dagwood, who is thinking what the dinner is going to cost him, sinks his teeth in his chair and thinks to himself, Bockheimer, Bockheimer, Bockheimer! <laughs> Wasn't that funny to see them chase up and down the streets looking for each other? Yes, and then they find out that the man had somebody else on the phone. He thought... Dagwood, that phone call was expensive, wasn't it? Yes, you bet it was. And Dag was pretty unhappy about it. <laughs> well, now look underneath Dagwood and Blondie. Look who's there. Big Ben Bo. Oh, yes, and I'm anxious to read that because Ben is in trouble. I'll read it in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. <laughs> Thank you.
Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Big Ben Bolt. Oh, and I'm worried about him because, you remember, Big Ben had got caught in the middle of what... What was that word, you know, when two families fight? Oh, a feud. Something that goes on for years and years. Yes, a feud. Well, well Ben had got caught in the feud between two families who lived in the mountains. Their, their names were Hallidays and the Ventures. Yes, and the Hallidays attacked the cabin where Ben was with the Ventures. And a little boy got shot. And Ben has told the Ventures to stop their shooting while he tries to get the boy to the doctor. And Ben opened the door and stepped out on the porch, and the Hallidays are right outside aiming their guns right at him. I wonder if they'll shoot. Well, let's find out right now. Here we go with Big Ben Bolt. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Faint and punch and dodge and twist. It's a knockout blow from Big Ben's fist. <laughs> ben comes through the open door, a wounded boy in his arms. One of the Halliday men draws a bead on him. And ben says, hey, listen to me, listen to me. I want to talk to you. The leader of the Hallidays holds up his hand. All right, hold your fire, Ashley Halliday. Last picture, top row. Ben walks to the man who says, Hey, you ain't no venture. What for are you sticking your nose and what ain't your business? Ben says, Listen, you crazy fools can shoot holes through each other until the cows come home. And he goes on, first picture, bottom row. That's your pleasure. But this boy hasn't harmed anybody, and he's going to die if he doesn't get to a doctor quick. Yeah, he's a venture, ain't he? He's just a kid. And he deserves to live until he's old enough to make up his own mind about joining in this insane murder game you play. Eh, you talk big and blowy, mister. You ain't even got a gun. I got a mind let my boy shoot you down where you stand. Ben just looks at the boy in his arms. And then the leader of the Hallidays changes his mind. He takes the boy from Ben and says, Ashley, take this boy over to the docks. The stranger sting. Oh, thanks. Last picture, the man chuckles and says, <laughs> Don't thank me yet, son. Leastways, not till you met up with little David. Hey, little David. Coming, Uncle. Oh, I'm glad that that holiday man listened to Ben and sent the boy to the doctor. So am I. It's mighty brave of Ben to face those holidays that way. Yes. I wonder why he wants Ben to meet little David. Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now let's turn over the page and see who's there. Oh, look, it's Roy Rogers. And you remember that Roy had saved the guard from being burned up on that stagecoach. And then he had brought the guard to a little trading post. And when the guard went inside the store, Roy heard a shot. Roy rushed in and found the guard lying on the floor, shot. And standing over him was Hairpin Dobbs, the man who had held up the stagecoach. And now he's holding a gun on Roy. And I wonder what'll happen to Roy. Well, let's read and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip I oh Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip I o Roy stands in front of Dobbs, his hands in the air, as Dobbs faces him with a gun. Roy says, Well, so you're hairpin, Dobbs. You shot this man so he wouldn't identify you as the hombre who held up his stage. <laughs> Meanwhile, outside the house, Sam Teal, the owner of the trading post, is listening. He takes a rifle and sneaks up beside the window, and he says to himself, I wonder what's happening in there. Ain't healthy for me to have a ruckus at my trading post. As Roy faces Hairpin Dobbs, the hold-up man says, third picture. Well, I suppose the shotgun guard told you what I was looking for in that stagecoach, eh, huh, Rogers? Well, you ain't gonna live to blab about it. He cocks his trigger to shoot Roy. But at that moment, Sam Teal, owner of the trading post, appears at the window. Last picture, top row, rifle in hand. Quickly, Dobb whirls, sends a shot at the rifle, which appears in the window. <laughs> Quickly, Roy leaps up, seizes a chandelier over his head, and swings his feet forward, knocking Dobbs over. <laughs> Teal comes in the door just then. Hey, that saddle bum only hit my rifle, Rogers. I'll lock him in my workroom till the sheriff arrives. All right, get moving, Hampin. Roy, who's kneeling over the guard, says... Well, this man's still alive. 
I'll see that he gets to a doctor pronto. A few minutes later, Sam Teal is facing Dobbs in his workroom. Dobbs says... That's the sheriff, and I'll expose you, Sam Teal. I'm wise you're smuggling fresh mine gold nuggets from the government Indian reservation. Teal answers, Shut up. Open that door behind you, Hap him. Dob snarls. Well, I figured you hide them somewhere on the stages when they're laid up for repairs next door, huh? Am I right? Dobbs goes out the door. Teal aims at his back and says... Okay, Harpin, the door's open. Get going, and good luck. Oh, it, it looks like Teal's gonna shoot Dobbs. Yes, it does, doesn't it? I wonder why. You know something? I don't trust that Sam Teal, even though he's helping Roy. Neither do I. And maybe we'll find out why we don't trust him next week. Well, now it's time for Dick's Adventures. So let's go to the very last page. Yes, and here he is. And you remember, last week Dick was in the early days of America with General Hull, and the English had just declared war on the Americans. And General Hull knows that the ship that's carrying his supplies will be captured by the British on Lake Erie. So he hurries his short-handed army to Detroit. Oh, I wonder if you'll get to the fort safely. Well, let's find out now. Here we go with Dick's Adventures. Say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. General Hall and his army reach the frontier town of Detroit. First picture, second roll. They find the 800 inhabitants of the fort, including many women and children, in the grip of terror. After he has investigated the situation, Hall says to Dick a little later, Oh, it's not the British we fear, lad. They're civilized. But that bloodthirsty devil, Chief Tecumseh, is fighting on their side. We hear he's got 5,000 braves ready to swarm down on us. Rather than await attack, General Hull, last picture, second roll, launches an assault first. Only to be driven back by the dire news that even greater hordes of Tecumseh's warriors are gathering. Outnumbered and faced with the prospect of wholesale massacre, Hull surrenders, and first picture bottom row, Detroit becomes a British city. As Dick salutes the flag with tears in his eyes, he sees it grow dimmer and dimmer. And he's saying, We lost Detroit. Lake Erie's bottled up. Yeah, but wait till Perry gets there. Last picture, Dick sits up and sees he's in his own hammock in his own backyard. Hey! I've been dreaming again. Oh, wasn't that sad that they had to give up the fort? Yes, it was. But General Hall was wise. He prevented the massacre of all those people by the Indians. Yes, I think it'd be better to lose the fort and save the people's lives. Yes, much better. I wonder what'll happen next week. A new adventure or some more about this? Well, we'll find that out next week. Now look underneath Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes. And you remember Rusty Riley and Tex and Pete and some of their fine horses are out on a farm near the seacoast. The farm is owned by Mrs. Jones. And a Mr. Marlowe is trying to get that farm away from Mrs. Jones. And he can do it, too, if she can't pay him some money that she owes him before the end of the week. So Rusty is going to try to help her. And he's training a horse to run in a race. And if he wins the race, he'll get $1,000. And he and Tex found some strange-smelling mud on the horse's hoops. And Rusty has shown Tex that the mud is on Mrs. Jones's farm. And Tex, when he saw the mud, said to Rusty that there was oil there. Oh, I'm anxious to find out more about this. Quick read. Please. Very well, here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Rusty says to Tex... Hey, Jeepers, Tex, if there's oil here, Mrs. Jones is really rich. And Pete says, Yes, yeah, sure, Tex. All we gotta do is to tell her, and then she can pay off that money she owes Mr. Marlowe. Now, whoa, whoa, now, there. Hold on there, boys. It ain't gonna be quite that simple, dealing with that Marlowe farmant. 
Oh, well, the way I see it, the test drilling showed oil here just about the time that Jones was killed in that truck accident. Now, Marlowe didn't want to share it with Mrs. Jones, so he got some phony engineer to sign a report that there's no oil at all. And he goes on last picture, top row. Yeah, and it looks like he's got things tied up good. A temporary lease in that holler must be to keep nosy folks away till he forecloses that mortgage. And that's going to be right soon. Rusty says first picture, bottom row. Well, well, well Tex... He won't do it if I can stop him. You see, our plan is to win the Blue Brook Handicap at the county fair. I had this colt pretty well broken before we left Milestone Farm. Oh, he's awful fast. And Pete says, yeah, and that race pays a thousand bucks. Well, Tex answers, well, banking on a racehorse is pretty much like counting unhatched chicks, Rusty. But darned if it ain't worth a try. <laughs> Next morning at the picnic grounds, Rusty is training his horse. Peter has been watching, asks, Well, how do you think he's doing, Rusty? Rusty answers, Oh, he's picking his feet up too high, Pete, like a hackney. He, he didn't do that when I rode him at the milestone track. Last picture, Pete says, well, 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 Rusty, you suppose that we did anything to his feet when we cleaned out that black clay? Rusty answers, Heck no, that wouldn't make him run that way. But whatever it is, he'll never win that race high-stepping. <laughs> to run that way. Well, that's something to worry about. Yes, it is, because Rusty says he can't win the race running that way, and Rusty knows because he knows everything about horses. Well, maybe next week you'll find out how to correct that. Oh, I hope so. Now, that's all the time I have, but before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Giggly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.